Um, okay, so um, um, water is, is the subject, and I think for most of you, you recognize that the importance of water for agriculture, for what you do. Uh, many people don't appreciate the importance of water and think it's purely secondary. And I, I hope to convince you uh, today that it's primary, it's not secondary, and it has everything to do with life. It's integrally involved uh, with it. Um, I, I start with, with uh, you might say, evidence, evidence that we don't really know everything there is to know about water. I, I think for many of you, you think, oh, water, water is water. You know, it, it may uh, have some impurities in it and such, but otherwise it's just, it's just sort of water. So what I want to demonstrate to you in the first few slides is that you're dead wrong. It's, it's not. And I'll, I'll do that by challenging you to explain some phenomena that are very common. And let's see if you can do it. So we start with a cloud. Now this cloud is sitting above a a res large reservoir of water, and the water is evaporating from everywhere. And so, if the water is evaporating from everywhere, you'd expect to have one giant cloud uh, covering the sky. And in Seattle, we often do. But how do you get a situation like this? You know, how 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 is it possible that you have one localized cloud when the water is evaporating everywhere? Do you know the answer? So what what's What's going on here? Is somehow is the water attracted to that one nucleating spot? Okay, I don't see a bunch of hands going up, so I'm, oh, you know the answer. Okay, I'm sorry, the water molecules. Yeah, but how do they get there? Yeah, yeah, that's the question. Okay, and here's and related to that, uh, what keeps the cloud up in the sky? Why does it float? So clouds consist of water. Water is heavier than air. A gravity pulls the water down. How does a cloud float? Maybe you never thought of that. <laughs> or maybe you did. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, yeah, I, but, but how does it, what, what makes it stay there? Why, why, why doesn't? Uh, air currents are always going up? I soar. Yeah, okay. Why is there rising air under clouds? Uh, okay. Because even on the side, it's the colder water. Okay. I'll move on, and we can, if you want to talk about it later, we can, we can talk about it. So here's another one water droplets floating on water. So you know when water meets water, the two coalesce instantly, right? Okay, well, this is something from our laboratory. We're just dropping water droplets on the surface of water. <coughs> How's that? It's good. It's good. Uh, what, what's going on? How come is my surface question. A uh, surface tension. Okay, uh, uh, it was surface tension. But why? Uh, so it's got tension, but uh, so what? Why? Why should that prevent the droplet from coalescing? Uh, I mean, there is surface tension. No, I'll be talking about surface. I'm sorry? Yeah. Where does the energy come from to break it? Okay. <laughs> so that's my point. We, we don't know everything about, about water. Okay, here's another one. Uh, uh, here's another. A actually, it would be good to save some of the questions till later because otherwise I won't get through. Uh, so, I mean, I love questions, but uh, here's. So you take two beakers and you put them um, rim to rim. You fill them with water. And you put one electrode in one, another electrode in the other. And you, pa you impose a high voltage. OK, and here's, here's what happens. You get a bridge between the two. And then you move one beaker from the other beaker with a motor. It's called a water bridge, floating water bridge. And it persists. Uh, indefinitely, and it persists uh, up to a distance of three to four centimeters. Please explain it. Can't explain it? So you don't know everything there is to know about water. Right. Okay, uh, I think I... Uh, witchcraft, that's the best answer yet. Witchcraft, okay. Um, and, uh, okay, and the final one, um, is, is this one. So this blue thing here is a superconducting magnet. 
And here we just have a trough full of water with some red dye for effect. The, the red has no other, uh, okay. Now, it's an ordinary trough of water, but uh, when you turn on the magnet, what happens is that the water splits so that Moses could walk through the Red Sea. <laughs> Explain it? Uh, yeah, you have an explanation. I don't have an explanation, but these are all examples of water being charged, electrically Well, that could certainly be part of it. Maybe at the end of the, of the talk, uh, some of these things will become clearer, I hope. But this was, charge is critically important. Uh, and, and so I, I presented these simply to give you a sense that we don't know everything there is to know about water. Because otherwise you'd be able to explain all these uh, easily, but you can't. So how did I get started in, in water, um, immersing myself? I studied muscle contraction for many years, the molecular mechanism. And then I met this guy, um, Gilbert Ling, who is, I guess, the arithmetic says, 99 years old, uh, getting, getting close to 100. And Gilbert came from China. He was the first of a group of three scholars invited from China after World War II uh, uh, to study in the US. And, and you can imagine the competition. Then there were three of them. And, um, and of the three, one guy, Yang, won the Nobel Prize in Physics. They all thought that this guy was the smartest of the three. So Gilbert had, by the time I got to know him, He'd written four or five books already, and the books were on water. And he was talking about water and biology. He said, water inside the cell is not like this water. He said, the molecules of water are organized or lined up in some way like a, like a crystal. And of course, despite the evidence, almost nobody believed him. I thought he was onto something important, and I gave his, one of his books to my students and postdocs, and unan the unanimous verdict was, this is really important, central to all of biology, and this guy is either right or almost right. So of course, we got interested, and the first task I took upon myself was to try to explain Gilbert Ling's ideas uh, to um, non-experts. This is not simple, because Gilbert Ling has a way of writing for himself, but not, not to uh, people beyond himself, and so I wrote this book, um, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life in 2001. And it basically described Gilbert's ideas and the evidence underlying the ideas that the water inside the cell in, in much of biology is, is organized and ordered. And the evidence that the book was very popular is shown in the next slide. <laughs> uh, and uh, the book actually did go on to demonstrate that water was central, that, that the ordering of water was central to everything that the cell does, and that actually the transition between ordered water and ordinary water like this was a trigger for many of the most fundamental events in biology. So without this ordered water, nothing happens. Uh, and one of the key points that um, I brought out uh, in, in the book, this diagram is taken from the book, is that uh, inside the cell, you have solids, mostly proteins, and then you have water molecules shown here as dipoles, you know, plus minus, plus minus dipoles, and that because of the charges on the surface, the water molecules would tend to line up with these charges, and you may get multiple layers of such, and eventually, when you go far enough from the surface, because of Brownian motion, thermal motion, the water tends to be disrupted. And most physical chemists will agree to some extent. Uh, they'll agree that you've got maybe one or two ordered, ordered molecular layers and then nothing more. And Gilbert Ling was saying, no, no, that's not true. The evidence is that the ordering of water molecules can extend way out uh, to dozens or even hundreds of molecular layers from the surface. And we thought this was really important and we wanted to pursue it experimentally. So uh, how do you pursue it? You know, it's not easy to see water molecules. And, and the way we, uh, we did it was we, we understood that this kind of ordered water, it's, it's like a crystal, and it has the tendency to exclude particles and, and solutes. So we're looking for some experimental situation where you got particles and particles are excluded from, from some region, and, and we were hunting for that. And 
by virtue of luck, I guess, I ran into a Japanese colleague who gave me some information and set us on the right trail. And that is, is shown here. So this is a gel, uh, like ordinary gelatin gel, except it, it wasn't that one, sitting in a chamber, you see here. And, uh, and next to the, here's the edge of the gel. And next to the edge of the gel, we put water and particles. And these particles are little spheres called microspheres. So the first thing we noticed, and we were actually expecting this because of, of the information from the Japanese colleague, we saw a region here um, where, where the particles were excluded. And this is a pretty big region, 10 micrometers or so, uh, by molecular standards. But it's even more dramatic than that because if you watch it over time, um, this is one of the first videos, you can see these particles get pushed out. And they get pushed out to a distance and then they stop. Um, and now we're talking about 50 micrometers, which is like half the thickness of one of your hairs. One of yours, not mine. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we thought maybe, possibly, uh, this is a region here of ordered water right next to the gel. Of course, we have no evidence for that, but we surmise that it's possible that that's the, that's the case. Um, and uh, somebody suggested to us, because we began seeing this time and time again, that we give it a name. And an Australian colleague came and said, well, why don't you call it exclusion zone? Because it excludes. You know, it makes sense. And also, it has the advantage that it can be abbreviated EZ, which is easy to remember. So, <laughs> so we wind up with EZ water um, uh, over here. And, and that stuck. It doesn't work in Europe, unfortunately, because it's EZ. <laughs> Uh, instead of easy to remember. Uh, well, okay, so here's another example. Uh, this is a polymer called nafion, and nafion is, is um, a bit like Teflon, the same backbone but with charged uh, sulfonate groups. And it comes in a sheet, which is horribly expensive, and you cut, cut a piece and plop it down at the bottom of the chamber and pour water with particles, the uh, spheres, and you can see already that um, there's this zone where the microspheres are excluded. And if, again, you watch it over time, uh, you uh, get the same sort of expansion. And this exclusion zone next to Nafion is even bigger. Typically, it's about a half a millimeter. In fact, it's so big, you don't need a microscope to see it. You can see it with your naked eye. So um, now this basic finding, especially with Nafion, has been confirmed by many people. And this list was constructed about six years ago, and by now there, there, there are many. And I want to show you that this is also a, a, appears in plants. So this is a slide that was given to me by the late Martin Canny. Some of you may know him. Um, he studied vascular systems in plants, and he was a very well-known scientist from, from Australia. And he sent me this electron micrograph. And, I regret, I, I don't know which species, I can't, can't recall, but what he did was he put particles, and the particles, you can see the particles in, in the uh, xylem vessel, and he pointed out that they congregate in the middle and along the edges, where you might expect to find it easy, there are no particles. So his conclusion is the same thing that happens in, with polymers and gels also happens um, in vessels. So what I want to do is get to the basis uh, of this phenomenon. And I want to answer five questions. Is the phenomenon general? Um, or just those few slides I showed? Does it really arise from the ordering of water? Or is it something else because I presented no evidence? Can water ordering explain those first few slides that I showed? And in order to create order, you need energy. So where does the energy come from? not obvious. It wasn't obvious to us either for some time. And might these findings apply broadly? And by the way, on the second one, I'm going to touch on the issue that some of you may be familiar with called water memory. Does water hold information? OK, on the issue of generality, um, um, the first question is, what kinds of surface will generate these exclusion zones. And we tested many, many kinds. We tested gels, uh, hydrogels. Um, and uh, everyone we tested shows this e exclusion. 
we've tested at least 12 to 15 of them, I have stopped counting, various polymers. And if they are hydrophilic, that is water loving, in other words you drop water it spreads out, as opposed to beating up like on Teflon. If they are hydrophilic, generally they show the exclusion, though not everyone does. Various biological surfaces uh, show it, including plant roots, for example. And monolayers, single, single molecular layers on, on gold. And meaning, if it's a single molecular layer, it looks like that layer is kind of like a template that allows for the buildup of this, of this EZ. So, so it's pretty general. Uh, and what's excluded from the exclusion zone? So we've looked at uh, m many uh, particles and solutes from from giant particles to small particles like microspheres to bacteria to viruses to large molecules like proteins uh, to small molecules down to molecular weight approximately 100 or so and uh, almost everything is excluded. So, um, and I, I'm skipping the evidence a little bit because there's a lot more that I want to include and all of this stuff is published. So, um, in terms of generality, Many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded, so it's general. Now, question number two, is this zone really physically different from bulk water? Um, now, I've alluded to the possibility that it might be different, that the molecules might be ordered in some way, but I've provided no evidence. So what's the evidence? So I'm going to go down the list, I'm going to talk only about one of them, a little bit more, because otherwise we'll, this will take the full 1.5 hours and there's more I want to talk about. Uh, okay, so here's a list of eight, there are actually probably at least a dozen by now. The easy water molecules are more constrained than ordinary uh, water molecules and that's by nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, the molecules are more stable, but they don't generate very much infrared uh, energy. Uh, the EZ water has negative charge, it's not neutral. This is critical, I'll come back to this, uh, because you expect any kind of water should be neutral, but this is negatively charged. EZ absorbs light at a wavelength <coughs> of 270 nanometers, that's in the UV, um, ordinary <laughs> water doesn't. EZ is more viscous by a couple of orders of magnitude than ordinary uh, water. The molecules are aligned, we can tell that by looking at the pyrefringence. The easy molecular structure differs from that of ordinary water, measured by IR absorption. And finally, uh, the optical properties are different, that is refractive index. And this is not done by us, but by two Russians, two uh, Russians both from Moscow, never met one another, both got interested, and um, one uh, did it in the physical system and one studied the biological system, they got the same result even quantitatively that the refractive index, that is the bending ability of easy uh, water is up to 11 percent higher than ordinary water. So there's a lot of evidence and so I want to go back to this one because as someone pointed out, electricity is very important in everything that I'm, I'm planning to, uh, to discuss. Um, so how did we find out that the EZ has negative charge? We took a very fine electrode, um, in fact invented by the same Chinese guy who, who I mentioned, Gilbert Ling. It tapers down, it's made of glass and it tapers down to less than one uh, micrometer. Um, and, and you can stick it in, you can stick it in cells and such, but you can stick it in, in the EZ and you can get very good spatial resolution. So you put one there and you put one in far away somewhere in the bulk water and you measure a potential difference. And it's always negative uh, in the EZ, 100 millivolts, 150, 200 millivolts negative. And, uh, but that's weird, right, because if you, think of, if you think of the experiment that's being done, you have a chamber, right, and you put a gel or a polymer or something in there and then you take water, ordinary water, neutral, and you pour it in and you expect neutrality throughout, but you get a region, a sizable region that has net negative charge. So at first, at first it simply didn't make any sense to us. We thought there must be a mistake. And so 
my Russian colleague, friend, was in the lab at the time, and his wife was doing similar experiments with gels and electrodes, and he calls her and says, in Russian, I can't understand, hello dear, or whatever he says you know, in Russian, try this experiment. And a few days later, we were confirmed that the result was exactly the same as we found. So we were gratified, and, and we tried it in a few different systems, gels and polymers, and we found, found the same. So if it's really true, and we think it is, uh, that this region is negatively charged, not neutral, negatively charged, then somehow you can't create negative charge from nothing, so there must be positive charge somewhere else. We have the idea that maybe what's going on is that the water molecules, H plus, OH minus, are getting broken into the negative part and the positive part, and the negative parts are somehow aggregating uh, right next to the nafion or next to the gel, giving us the EZ, and the protons, positive charge, should be somewhere else. So where's the evidence for the positive charge somewhere else? Um, and um, we used, to check this, we used a pH sensitive dye, you know, the same stuff that's in litmus paper, changes color, right? It comes in soluble form, you can just put it into the chamber and you see all this nice color distribution. And we were looking for a high concentration of protons somewhere because if the water molecules are splitting into negative and positive, we've got to find the positive somewhere. So this is a, next slide is a result, let me explain. Um, so this is a piece of nafion. Um, this is the exclusion zone here. And uh, notice, by the way, that the dye molecules, which have molecular weight approximately 100 or so, don't get in. This region remains clear, um, no dye. So it means that molecules the size of these dyes uh, uh, don't penetrate into the exclusion zone. They're excluded. But if you look at the color distribution for this particular dye, orange means very low pH, very high concentration of protons. It, it's um, uh, the pH, uh, the red color corresponds to pH 3 or less. So very low uh, pH. So we found, indeed, that next to this negatively charged region should be a positively charged region. And just to be sure that we're not deluding ourselves into thinking there's something there that's really not there, we, we did the acid test, so to speak. And that is, you put one electrode here, one electrode here, that is one in the negative, one in the positive, and connect them through a resistor. And if one region is positive and the other one's negative, you should get current flow through the resistor. Um, and next slide shows one of the first um, experiments we did to demonstrate that. So here is current on the y-axis and time here. And you can see current starts from some large value and then diminishes. It diminishes to a plateau which is not zero. It continues. And, um, and because of this current flow between the positive and the negative, we have confirmation that there really is separated charge. So it really looks, like, really looks like the molecules of water are getting split into the negative component and the positive component, just like, in a sense, the first step in photosynthesis. Um, and so what, what we really have is a charged battery in, in water. Here is a hydrophilic surface next to water, and from the water builds this negatively charged EZ and charges, a positive charges uh, beyond, okay. And this, this is significant for what, what follows. So, so far, I, I've shown you that there's, uh, next to hydrophilic surfaces with charges uh, on them, uh, there's a liquid crystalline region, um, as Gilbert Ling has suggested. It has negative charge, not neutral. It excludes solutes profoundly. And some of the evidence I presented suggests that this dipolar model, the stacked dipole, is not correct. I'll come back to that in a moment because structure is everything for understanding. Uh, and this region of order may extend very far. So how far is very far? If, if you do the computation, it's, it's millions of molecular layers. It's, it's not two or dozens or so, but millions. It can extend, extend way, way out. Um, so the idea that this kind of ordered water is a different phase of water is not original. Um, 
It came from Sir William Hardy, who was a famous colloid physical chemist from more than 100 years ago, who said, there's a problem, guys, he said, you know, with, with the water, because there are so many observations that don't fit the, the standard idea of three phases. The only way to explain these uh, is, is that you must have a fourth phase. Uh, so he suggested that without a lot of evidence more than 100 years ago. The number of anomalies that exist in water is now up to, I think, uh, close to about 70 last count. And you can find them all on a website if you look under water anomalies. So um, the idea that, uh, that this may be a fourth phase of water is old. It's not new at all. Um, now, um, why, uh, why am I suggesting that there's something wrong with this dipole model? It's a great model. It looks pretty, you know, and I, it's in my earlier book. And wh why would I suggest that we and other people were wrong? Well, the answer is, is actually very simple. Um, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. So um, this region has negative charge, but dipoles consisting of plus minus, <laughs> dipoles are neutral. So you can take dipoles and stack the dipoles from here to Boston or whatever, and you'll never get negative charge uh, out of, you start with neutral components and stack them. So, so it's got to be wrong, unfortunately. You know, throw away those nice, nice diagrams. Uh, now, uh, we went through an um, extensive thought process, an analytical process, to get what we believe is the real structure. And I'm not going to go through it. It's in the book that you, you were talking about, because there's more than I want to talk about, and my time is not infinite. <laughs> so the structure we came up with is, looks something like this. You have a hydrophilic material next to water. And out of the water build these layers. And these layers are hexagonal, um, <coughs> as you see in nature. And they build one at a time. So you got another one here, and another one, and so on. And they just keep building. Um, and the structure, if you were to look at it, is hexagonal, uh, like this, with oxygens and hydrogens arrayed, as, as you see here. And if you were to count the number of oxygens and hydrogens um, in a unit cell, uh, it turns out it's not H2O. It's actually H3O2. And why, why is that not a surprise? Well, it's not a surprise because H2O is neutral. But we know that each one of these each one of these layers has to have negative charge. Otherwise, the EZ wouldn't have a negative charge. So, um, so we wind up with H3O2. If it were H4O2, it would be double this one, and it would be neutral. But because we're missing a positive charge here, the net charge is negative, which is what the experiments dictate. Now, because this is a, a kind of liquid crystal, you, you, you might think that, um, that it actually could be solidified, if you think about it. Because crystals, you know, take salt crystal or sugar crystal, uh, you can make a solid out of it. And the question is, can easy water be solidified? And the answer is yes. It is not done by us, by, but by another group of Vittoria, Vittorio Elia uh, from Naples, Na Napoli, uh, Naples. And what he did, um, or actually what his wife did, <laughs> he, he's sort of the director and his wife does the work. So, uh, so he takes a, a Petri dish with a sheet of naphion and she pours some water, a little bit of water, easy builds, and after the easy build she rolls the easy off into a, a, a container and she'll do this a thousand times to get enough volume to, uh, to have something respectable. And if they take that water and just put it into a beaker, um, what happens is it looks like this, where some of the water is clear and the rest of it forms this, this cloud-like uh, conglomerate, which is not really a surprise that it looks very much like the clouds in the sky. Anyway, that's not the final step. The final step, or even before these clouds actually form, is uh, to put it into a freeze dryer and, um, uh, and at low temperature draw off the water. It's called the lyophilizer and it's used in biochemistry and you know many biochemical uh, labs, and they wind up with something like this. This is solid water, easy water at room temperature. Solid water at room temperature, right? You can pick it up and you can feel it, uh, which we've done. They graciously gifted us some of this stuff, and we squandered it. 
uh, without doing anything particularly useful. It, it looks like it's kind of fragile, thread-like, but it's water, it's solid water at room temperature. Imagine, I mean, it, it blows, blows your mind, and they've done the right controls for it. It feels like a, a fragile thread, and, and it, once you put some shear on it, it just pr practically disintegrates into a powder. Um, okay, now, so when, when you think that you've got a solid crystal, think about the question or the issue of information and memory. So um, the question I'm asking now is could easy water contain memory or information? And of course, you know, initially you say, well, this is really going too far out. But think about Think about the memory in your, in your laptop, right, with a thumb drive, what's inside? Well, it's a crystalline array of uh, silicon or silicon dioxide, and every atom is arrayed in the three-dimensional array, not just planar, but the op in, in the Z uh, direction also. And uh, each one of these can have two different states, a zero or a one, right? That, that's how um, the information goes into a digital computer. And think of how the solid easy water, or even liquid crystalline easy water, is similar to this. So you have um, here, uh, this is semi-solid, or it could be, could be solid, and you have oxygens and hydrogens that are arrayed three-dimensionally in, in this lattice. Uh, and the idea that um, electromagnetic waves coming to this could conceivably uh, impact, let's say, certain oxygen atoms. So, for example, this guy here and, and, and this guy here. Now, the important thing is that oxygen can have five different states. Not two states, but five states. We, we refer to the oxidation states. You can have minus two, that's the most common one. Minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, five of them. So if you think that each one of these guys here could, have, could be not um, a zero and a one, but five different states, the amount of information, the information density that could be stored in, in this is enormous. I forget, we did the calculation, it's something like 10 to the ninth more than in a standard digital uh, computer memory. <coughs> so, <coughs> so there's huge information storage capacity. And uh, uh, the question is, will this information storage in easy water replace conventional uh, storage? You can imagine uh, your computer memory is filled with easy water, either in liquid crystalline or solid state. Right now, this is a fantasy, but the, the possibility is there. But also, you know, for all of us thinking about biology, if the water inside your cell is easy water, this water has the capacity to store and even transmit information from the environment, from anywhere. So there are many reports. We organize uh, the annual conference uh, on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water each year. Uh, and each one contains multiple presentations by people demonstrating that water uh, demonstrates it can, it it has the capacity for information storage and memory. I think this is a, going to, ha in the future, this is going to be a really important area of interest for plants, animals, any living creature. Okay, so long answer to question number two, is the easy physically distinct from the bulk? The answer is yes. To the best of our understanding, it's a layered hexagonal honeycomb structure with information storage capability. Um, now, when you think of information storage in water, some of you um, will think about uh, Masaru Emoto. Um, how many of you have heard of this guy? Oh, okay, <laughs> so this is common knowledge. Um, by the way, I just got an email an hour ago from his son. He passed, but um, and we're, we're going to get together. I'm off to Japan tomorrow morning. So, um, so if you know, then, then you know that the crystals that form depend on the uh, consciousness or information or, or even energy that's, that's input. So if, if it's a Mozart symphony uh, uh, or such, you get beautiful ice crystals. But if it's heavy metal and such, you get ugly, ugly crystals. And of course, no scientist who I know um, uh, believes that, that this is really uh, true or important because he tended to cherry pick his 
his, uh, his, his uh, photos that, that he took. Uh, nevertheless, I think it is possible that it's true because of the information storage capacity that we've demonstrated in water. And so this is uh, Emoto um, <coughs> at Fukushima. And he has uh, uh, people still, still working. Um, this is Akiko Stein uh, working in Germany producing these crystals. Um, so this is, this is continuing. Uh, okay, question three. Can crystalline water explain uh, counterintuitive uh, anomalies that we started with? Uh, and so one is the cloud, and the question is, how, how, do, how does this happen? How, I mean, if there's water that's evaporating here, the same as here, why don't you get a, a one long continuous cloud? And, and to understand that, I want to go back to uh, a basic principle. And uh, the principle is, is illustrated here. Um, so suppose you have two, two particles. They could be water droplets, but just the two particles. And, and the particles have negatively charged EZs around them, negatively charged EZ, and complementary positive charges uh, around them and around them. And so my question to you, I need an answer. This is a question. These two are negatively charged, right? If you were to drop two negatively charged uh, particles, just like this, in water, um, what happens to the distance between them? They're both negatively charged. They go apart. It, what you, they, in, yeah, okay, and the right answer is they come together. Uh, sorry. Uh, they come together. Why, why, why would they come together? Uh, well, uh, and th this is not an observation from our laboratory, although we've demonstrated it. This is a very old observation. It seems counterintuitive. Why, you know, opposite charges uh, should repel one another. Uh, and there's no contradiction to that. It's just that what happens is that, remember, these positive charges are here. And as, as the negatively charged EZ forms, the complementary positives form around it. Same thing happens here. And the concentration of positives here is pretty high because you have contributions from this one and this one, and therefore these positives pull these negatives, and these positives pull these negatives, and they begin to come together. And, and this is called like likes like by the legendary Nobel physicist Richard Feynman from the <coughs> second half of the last century. He called it like likes like, you know, they like each other, they come together, because of an intermediate of unlike. But uh, until these observations, it wasn't clear where these unlikes might come from. But I've demonstrated where they come from. And the principle, like, likes, like, because of an intermediate of unlike, is very old. And the principle actually starts from the tale of Genji, which uh, I think the year 1200 or 1300 uh, from Japan. And the tale talks of warring clans, and the clans would be a war. They would never, ever get together uh, without the intermediate <laughs> that could draw them together, you see. So, so like, likes like because of an uh, um, intermediate of unlike charges. So they come together, contrary to what, what you thought. They actually come together. And when do they stop? Um, well, you get stability when the attractive force, that is plus pulling minus, plus pulling minus, is equal to the repulsive force of this repelling this, then they're stable. And if you have many of these uh, particles, droplets, whatever, then you have a situation that looks like this, uh, fairly regular. It's called a colloid crystal. And, um, and the particles stick together because of like likes like. And if any of you had yogurt for breakfast, um, the, the structure of the yogurt is probably uh, reflected uh, right here in, in this kind of structure. So what about the cloud? Well, the same thing occurs in the cloud because what you have, you have little droplets, and the droplets are actually surrounded by membranes of EZ. Um, I haven't proved that to you, but um, we, it, it's what we found. So you have these negatively charged droplets, and you have positive charges that uh, come from the atmosphere. And so because of those positive charges, the negatively charged droplets stick together, and that's why clouds form. And if you were to have for example, another droplet here, it would be attracted by this positive, come together, and the cloud would grow bigger. So you have discrete 
punctate clouds that grow because of this principle. Uh, another one is, is a coin sitting on top of the water. And someone mentioned surface tension. Um, and this is a common explanation for this phenomenon. The water is known to have a high surface tension. And uh, so some of you have done this experiment with paper clips or with pins. You know, if you, if you put it carefully on the top, despite its high density, the pin stays. It doesn't sink. If you put it underneath the surface, it plummets to the bottom. So this is just one example of such. And we wondered whether the common idea underlying surface tension, that is one molecular layer with, with hydrogen bonds, excess hydrogen bonds, is sufficient to explain something like this. And we found that, uh, in fact, um, that the easy water, crystalline water, grows at the air-water interface. In other words, at right here is a layer of easy water. And the way we found it was something like this. We took a chamber which is built of two sheets of glass, like this, and um, sealed around the edges to form a chamber. And then we fill it with water and microspheres. And it's cloudy because the microspheres scatter light. So you have air up here. You have the meniscus here. And what we found is that a clear zone opens up. It takes about 10, 15 minutes for the microspheres to get excluded from this region. So this region is very similar to an EZ. Uh, with microelectrodes, we found that it has negative charge. And the next slide will show you that this clear region, which sits on, on top, um, is actually a gel-like, has gel-like character. It's not water. I'll show you that here. So here, here are the microspheres in water. And here's the clear zone. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a glass rod, touch the surface, perturb it mechanically, move it back and forth, and you'll see that the thickness, the height of this dark zone, hardly changes at all. It's cohesive. It sticks together just like a gel. And um, so here it is, comes down, perturbs. The height of that dark zone, you see, doesn't change. So it's like a thick rubber band that sticks together. And I think uh, because of that, that explains why so you've got many structured layers, molecular layers, at the top to create the high surface tension. I think that's the reason why you could put a pin or a, or a coin or a paper clip on top and why it, it'll float. It also explains the behavior of this creature, um, a lizard from Central America. And a lizard spends most of his time sitting on a tree branch, relaxing, and when it gets stimulated for what reason nobody, nobody really knows. It jumps off and, um, and it walks on the water. And because it walks on water, it's called the Jesus Christ lizard. Uh, and, um, you know, the question is, why does it do that? And we believe it's because of a thick EZ on the surface that allows it to do it. And this thick EZ may also, um, uh, the surface may also offer support for other heavy items, like at least partially, besides Archimedes um, holding, holding ships afloat. Another point is that crystals can be pretty stiff. Um, and if, if you look at, at this awesome uh, image, ordinary water doesn't do this. You've never seen ordinary water, nor would you expect ordinary water to have this, this capability. But if you have a crystal of water, like an easy crystal um, that's charged up to be stiff, you can imagine, I mean, this, this is so stiff, you could, you could test, you could judge the stiffness by the droop. There's very little droop. It looks as though you can almost walk across it. Um, and, and you can understand that if it's easy water that's creating this, then it could be easily be stiff. Remember, easy can be a solid. So the answer to question three is yes. Uh, liquid crystalline water explains many anomalies. I, if I had time, I'd go into more. Um, the book that you mentioned has many, many of them. OK, so now the critical question, um, at least I think it's the critical question, what charges the water battery? So we have a water battery. Remember, EZ is negative. You've got positive and negative. Um, and you've got order. And both of those require energy to create, right? You have to, to, to start from chaos and build order. You need to put energy. It's sort of like cleaning your room. You know, it gets messy uh, over time. 
in order to straighten it out, you've got to put some energy in. And so the principle is, is pretty much the same. And to charge the battery, so your cell phone runs down, uh, you want to, in order to make it work, you need to recharge it. But the chamber can't be plugged into 110 volts. So we struggled for quite a while to figure out where the energy comes from to build this easy and, and to charge it the way it is. And, and finally, we knew the answer after a few years. And had, I, I was giving a talk to a class, and I asked the question, similar to what I'm asking right here. The students, of course, did, didn't know. And um, I had them think about it. And one, one student timidly raised his hand, and he said, light? <laughs> and, and it was the right answer. And he got it right away. It took us three years. So we quickly hired him into our laboratory. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and, and actually, the observation that it was light that, that built it, light energy, photons, came from another student who was also doing something that he wasn't supposed to do. So he's, he's working at a, at a lab bench. He's got the chamber sitting there and looking at the EZ with his microscope. And he noticed there was a gooseneck lamp sitting next to him. He picked, up a, he picked up a lamp and shined it onto the chamber. And, and this is what he saw. This is an actual image, one of the first images. Uh, so this is a piece of nafion. Here's the exclusion zone. And here are the microspheres beyond the exclusion zone. And ordinarily, this is a straight line. This runs like that. But where he was shining the lamp, the exclusion zone, and this is a real image. This is not real. <laughs> uh, Exclusion zone expanded like this, and when he took away the lamp, it went back down. It was a time constant of some tens of minutes. So we figured out, it didn't take great intelligence to figure out, you know, if you shine light, it grows bigger, then it looks like light energy is responsible for creating this stuff. Um, and we, we did experiments. I won't bother you with details, but in the experiments we found, we checked many wavelengths ranging from the UV through <coughs> infrared, and we found that infrared, especially at three micrometers, was the most effective in building this. Just a small amount of a very low intensity LED shined on here at three microns would build this up to 10 times the original size. Very, very powerful. So your, your question should be, or is maybe, where does infrared come from? Uh, so you, you know, um, if, you, if you look into the toaster and the coils are glowing bright orange, you know that it's giving off heat and giving off infrared energy. But in fact, you don't, don't need a toaster uh, for this or an oven. It, the energy is coming from everywhere. And, and the evidence from that, the infrared energy, the evidence for that is if we were to turn off all the lights, and instead of using my cell phone camera, if I used an infrared camera, it's the same deal except the sensor is sensitive not to visible light but to infrared light, I get a beautiful image even though I could see nothing with my eyes, but the infrared camera will detect that you're giving off infrared energy, the chair is, your briefcase is, and the walls, and the camera, etc. So that's why they're used as night lights, because everything. So it means it, infrared energy is all over. It's freely available. It doesn't cost you a nickel. So it's literally free energy. You learned about free energy maybe in your chemistry class, but this is literally free energy. It's all around, which means since this is the energy that's responsible for building the EZ, it means that under the right conditions you always have EZ. So you have a situation like this. We have a hydrophilic material next to water. You will always have some EZ because of the ambient infrared energy. And if you were to increase the energy with a lamp or something, it grows bigger. And take it away, it goes back to the uh, original. So the answer to question number four is actually very simple. Um, where does the energy come from? And uh, the easy buildup is powered by photons. And these photons, the energy from the photons, orders the water and charges the water battery. And the situation is something like this. It's not Boston, but Hawaii. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, it, all you just basically exist with, with infrared energy. 
Other wavelengths work too, but infrared is the, the most powerful. So, so I'm telling you that, that, that this glass of water is absorbing infrared energy from the environment all the time. And, and if so, your question might be, well, hell, if it's absorbing energy, it must release the energy somehow, otherwise it would explode. So the question that you might ask is, you know, can you somehow harvest the energy from the water? Because it's got energy in, inside of it. Um, and, and the answer is, although you've never seen a glass of water doing work, right? I think, maybe someone, I'm going to show you that a glass of water can do work, okay? Uh, and that it can be harvested. And this was, the experiment was done, um, the original experiment by another disobedient undergraduate student. We, we get lots of undergraduates and I tell them, you must do this. No, not exactly, but they, they tend to have a sense of freedom and some of the more interesting observations from our lab come from these disobedient undergraduate <laughs> students. I should say maybe students endowed with curiosity. So this student, um, we, we had just found out that Nafion comes not only in sheets but in tubes, you know, like a straw. And his job was to take the Nafion um, uh, um, uh, tube like, like this, put it in water, and look at it with a microscope and see if an EZ is, it builds inside the tube and outside the tube next to the surface. And he went on doing that and one day he came barging into my office. I was sitting there with some, I think important, but I can't remember, but maybe not so interesting visitor. And the student came barging in. Usually they don't do that, but he said, you know, I found something interesting. And uh, it was interesting enough for him to interrupt the boring conversation. And he said, you know, I'm observing this in the microscope and I can see flow going through the tube and it just keeps going without stopping. He said, I think this is interesting. And I thought, this is not only interesting, this is revolutionary because, because usually, you know, if you have a tube and you have flow, you have to push it through. You need a pressure gradient like the large arteries coming from your heart. Heart builds up pressure and, and sends the flow through. And so I thought, if he sees, th there's no pressure gradient here because these two ends are sitting at the same depth underneath the water. And so the only possibility that we could see for driving it is the energy that I was talking about that's being absorbed in the water from the environment. Environmental energy getting transduced. So I thought if it's really true, it's very important. It turns out it's true because we did the right controls and the experiment looks like this. So you pick up the tube and, and first you put some water inside of it, make sure there are no air bubbles. And then you dunk it into a chamber with water and microspheres. And then you take it to the microscope. We use green light instead of white light because to reduce the, some of the uh, illumination from the microscope. And this is what you see in an Affion tube. And we've had, it, we've had this going for up to a day and a half. And I think we know how to keep it going for even, even longer. Well, someone said, uh, ah, you know, this is, must be some crazy quirk of Nafion tubes. Why don't you try tubes made of other materials and see if you get the same result. We couldn't find tubes made of other hydrophilic materials that are narrow enough. Maybe we didn't look hard enough, but we created our own and we created them inside of gels. So you can take a gel and as the gel, as, the, as it gels, we, we had a, a wire and as it's beginning to gel, you pull out the wire and you get a tunnel. Okay, so you have a chunk of gel with a tunnel that runs through the chunk of gel and you take this chunk with the tunnel and you put it in a bath containing water and microspheres to see what happens. Um, so that's how... In terms of direction of flow. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, the answer, <laughs> the answer is we don't know. <laughs> Uh, one day it goes this way, one day it goes that way, but we have some information and maybe at the end could you ask it again I'll give you a little more detail but I want to make sure I get through, okay? It's a really good question. Uh, <coughs> uh, and, and so this is a polyacrylic acid gel, the gel is here and here and this is the tunnel that runs through and what you might expect is when you put this 
a little chunk into a bath of water and microspheres, you get an EZ next to the gel, and the microspheres are excluded, so they're here, and it's symmetrical. So all of the microspheres gather here, and if you look at the video, uh, whoops. It does the same thing. We've tried half dozen different gels and we get the same result. Quantitatively a bit different, but we get flow through all of them. So, um, so as long as you have an easy, you're going to get flow. And we think we understand how this is going. I, I could tell you in the uh, Q and A if, if if you want, but I, I want to go on to some other material. But uh, so another another uh, visitor critic said, well, if you think all of this is driven by light. Why don't you just turn on more light and see if it goes faster? So we did that. We published the uh, result and we could get, with increased light, we could increase the speed by up to five times. So it really is driven by light. So this is light-induced flow. Um, so uh, basically, we have a hollow tube sitting in water and to produce flow, Work is done because the water has viscosity, right? And if work is done, you must have energy, otherwise you can't get work without energy. And so, where does the energy come from? The only, only energy source that we could conceive of, and maybe someone else could come up with another idea, is, is the light energy that's absorbed by the water, see, being, being converted. So the water is basically then a transducer of light energy, in this case, into <coughs> mechanical energy. And we've seen other conversions uh, discussed in my book. But, so this sounds a little bit weird. You know, water, you've never heard that water is a transducer of one kind of energy into another kind of energy. But if you think about um, what goes on with a plant, right, where does the plant get its energy? Well, you guys are the experts on that. You know where the energy comes from. So, so the, the light energy is, is uh, transduced into uh, chemical energy, which drives metabolism, growth, bending, flow, essentially everything. And I'm suggesting to you from the results of these experiments that the same thing happens in water, that the water is uh, absorbing uh, light and, and it gets, uh, the energy gets transduced into, in the case I just showed you, into mechanical energy or, or flow. And, and uh, from that, you, you, it's no surprise, really, because the plant is mostly water, right? And so it's not a big surprise that what happens in the plant also happens in the water. And so we, we wind up with, with the equation, um, uh, which looks like E equals H2O. It looks like an iconic equation that you've seen before. But uh, it, it, um, and even though I apologize because the units don't match, but I think you know what I mean, that this water contains energy, and the energy can be used and is used. See, it was not just passive. This is an energy transducer. Okay, so why is all of this uh, important? Well, I think it's foundational, um, if right. Uh, it could be foundational for any or all science involving water and molecules and light. Um, and and also uh, foundational, I, I, I want to talk specifically in the uh, time that we have, uh, foundational for health, both in animals and plants. And so, <coughs> so I start with, does human biology use light or radiant energy? So we obviously, you folks know better than anybody, the plants do that, but we don't think that we do it. But I want to demonstrate to you that we use the same principle, that we use light, that we don't necessarily photosynthesize, but the first step of photosynthesis, the splitting of water into plus and minus from light, is something that we use, we, you and I use all the time. So, uh, so here, let me explain what I mean. We, uh, we receive radiant energy from the environment all the time. And uh, uh, so, uh, Mother Nature, when, when, when she invented animals, you, I guess you had two choices. One is to exploit an energy transduction mechanism that was so successful in green plants and keep it for us, or animals, or discard it and replace it completely with something else. 
I don't know about you, if I were Mother Nature, I'd sort of keep it in reserve, either as backup or a supplement for other kinds of energy that we might get from foraging and such. And, and so one possible example that you might think of is the cardiovascular system, because the capillaries tend to be, can be fairly superficial, the light penetrates, depending on the wavelength, reaches the, the capillaries. And, uh, and so this is a question, is it possible that, that um, somehow this light is used to drive flow in our cardiovascular system? And uh, immediately you'd say, oh, this is, this is really far out. And I thought it was far out too until, um, and I thought I, I thought I knew what there was to know about pressure, flow, dynamics in the cardiovascular system because I did my PhD on that subject. And I, I emerged with a sense of arrogance that, oh, I, you know, ask me any question about pressure waveforms and flow waveforms, I got it down pat. Until some years ago, I visited my friend at Moscow University, Vladimir Vayakov, and he was uh, in a hurry to introduce me to the guy in the lab next door. And the guy in the lab next door was studying the cardiovascular system, and I thought, I got nothing to learn from this guy because I know what there is to know about pressure and flow and such. So he starts telling me there's a big problem in the cardiovascular system. <laughs> What's the big problem? He said the big problem is very simple. He said um, the red blood cells um, are six or seven micrometers in, in diameter. Um, uh, and the capillaries, you'd expect them to be bigger, but many of the capillaries are smaller. You see, so you've got a plumbing problem, uh, right? Uh, the capillaries can be three or four micrometers. I'll just um, give you a, just an, an example. So uh, this is what red blood cells are supposed to look like. Uh, you've seen pictures of them. And this is a piece of muscle tissue with capillaries running through. And you can see that the red blood cells are squeezed uh, in order to get through. Uh, this is, um, you can see... A, a, video here. Uh, this guy is having a lot of trouble making, making it through. And so he said, he said there's a um, problem. We don't need to look at this forever. Uh, uh, there's a problem. It takes energy to squeeze these red blood cells and push them through. And he cal calculated how much energy was required. We don't really think about that, about the energy that's required. But his calculations show that if the heart were responsible for, uh, of course, the heart is responsible for driving the blood through the big vessels, but when it gets down to the small vessels, if you have to squeeze them, each one, push it through, he said if the heart were responsible, it would need to develop a pressure something like one million times the pressure that it actually develops. And this would be really high blood pressure. So he said, <laughs> he said something, it's got to be something else, and he had various theories about how it worked, and, and suddenly, you know, um, the bulb lit, and I'm thinking, we just have these measurements um, uh, f uh, f in flow in tubes, you know, these narrow tubes, and, uh, and the question is, um, is, it, is it possible, um, in these tubes, we know that radiant energy or light drives the tubes, and might radiant energy help to, uh, to drive the flow through these small, small vessels? Uh, we, we had the, the idea, it's, if you think about it, this is a big deal because we're talking about a lot of energy that, that needs to be used in order to do it. It's kind of like your toilet, you know, your, sometimes your toilet gets stopped um, and you need to take the plunger and, and push the stuff through in order to clear it. Uh, this is a very similar uh, analogy and it's happening all the time in your cardiovascular system. So we asked the question um, that's shown here, might light, radiant energy help to drive blood flow. And we looked in the literature to start with, and we found a really interesting uh, study. We did our own, I'll tell you in a, in a moment. It was a, by an Israeli group. They were studying mice, and they were measuring blood flow in capillaries. And they opened the chest uh, the, of, of the mouse. They did their experiment. I don't remember what they were doing. But at the end of the experiment, they did what investigators properly do. They sacrificed the mouse. Um, and they were still measuring blood flow, and it didn't stop. The heart, they clamped the aorta, the heart stopped in 10 seconds, and the flow continued. It didn't continue at the same velocity, it was considerably reduced, but it kept flowing 5 minutes, 
10 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, beyond one hour. They couldn't believe what they were seeing because if the heart's not pumping, <laughs> something else must be doing the job. They repeated this in 10 different mice and they got the same result. And they were flabbergasted, they couldn't figure it out. So, so we began thinking, maybe the mechanism that we saw in the laboratory is operating in the capillaries and, and uh, is responsible for the continuation of flow. So we did our own experiments and they're just about done right now. This is a student in my laboratory and we use a chick embryo. So the, the um, egg is fertilized and you can see here this is the shell and the shell, the top of the shell has been removed and you can see the three day old embryo growing and you can see all the blood and the hearts over here and we are able to image the flow here and here. So step one, step one is to stop the heart by injecting potassium chloride that works just fine and measure the flow. And so the result looks like this. This is time here. And, and so here the heart stops and the flow goes down, but it doesn't go to zero. It goes down to some steady uh, low value. And then to test to see whether the same mechanism is, is working in the vessels that we saw in the laboratory, the key is to add infrared energy and see if it flows faster. And you can see the result here. We turn on the infrared flow increases by about three times and then it comes back toward the control. So it looks like radiant energy does um, drive blood flow and, um, and, and this is happening in, in your own vessels right now. Uh, it looks from our evidence that it's not just your heart that pumps uh, the blood, it's actually a, a self, we call self-driven -driv flow mechanism similar to what we saw in the, in the laboratory. Um, and um, I think it's similar for plants. We studied um, onion cells and we saw the same. If you increase, you can watch the flow in the onion cells. You turn on uh, the infrared energy, it goes faster. So, um, so now the question is what about elsewhere in your, in your body? Um, um, does the same principle apply? Do we use light in some way in your body? And I think the answer is yes. So here's a cell uh, with a yellow membrane and here's, here's the water and each one of these macromolecules, mostly proteins, uh, will have an easy uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding it that you see here. And of course the cell is very crowded. This grossly underestimates the density inside the cell. So you have a situation that's more, more like this. It's crowded and the negatively, negative charges practically fill the cell. Side issue, all cells have negative electrical potentials. Um, those of us who study biology learn that the negative potential occurs by some membrane pumps and channels in the membrane and I'd like to suggest to you without evidence, I have a paper on that, that the negative electrical potential actually comes from the easy water that's inside the cell. You fill the cell with negative charges and you got to measure a negative electrical potential. That's a side issue. But now, see all of these negative charges repel one another. They want to get away from each other, they want to get out and this tendency to, to repel and want to get away from each other constitutes potential energy. And this potential energy can be used for doing the work of the cell which is basically protein folding. So you have a situation that's like this that um, you have a protein and you have easy water surrounding the protein and you know protein folding does the work of the cell. If it's a muscle cell it mediates contraction, if it's a secretory cell it mediates secretion, etc. And so what happens is that the easy water melts and the protein folds and then it does its job and it unfolds back to the initial and easy water builds again, so it's cyclic. So the easy water is a critical part um, of the protein folding mechanism. If you don't have easy or if you don't have enough easy, then the protein is in a strange environment that doesn't know what to do uh, and so it misfolds or doesn't fold and, and your cell is not working properly, it's pathological. So now think about energy flow um, do, doing all of this. Um, and uh, so we start with light which builds EZ and um, develops negative charge in, inside the cell and this is potential energy and the energy is responsible for driving the work or folding 
of the, of the proteins. Now, if you connect the dots, light is an, an original builder of work inside the cell. So if you ask the question, where do we get our energy, you and I, obviously we get energy from food, but I'd like to suggest from what I've shown you that we also get energy from light in the same way that plants get energy from light um, or similar. The light is absorbed by the water, it builds easy and supplies us with energy. Some of you know about the people who don't eat. Um, they think they're getting their energy somehow from light and I think that's the case. Now, should this matter to you? Uh, well, obviously water matters and light matters. And so for your, your health, um, you've got to ask the question, what is it that builds easy water in your cells? Because if you want to remain healthy, it's necessary to, have, to be hydrated. This is hydration. This is what uh, easy water is hydrating your cells. So, so I'm going to give you six um, um, opportunities what you can do to maintain your, the good health that I know you all have because you're so physically active. Um, the first is obviously water. It's the raw material for building easy water. If you don't drink enough water, um, you're going to be dehydrated and you won't be able to function very well. Uh, I think some of you have had that experience. Um, the next one is green juicing. Um, so many uh, of the alternative medicine practitioners will recommend that you take fresh plants, squeeze them, get the juice out, and drink it. And, um, you know, and this, this uh, will be helpful for you. I, I think the film last night was um, pointing in that direction also. And, and the reports are from many of these people that just doing this is sufficient to restore your health, independent pretty much of what your problem is. You come back a few months later and you're feeling robust and healthy and full of energy. And so what are you, what are you drinking when you do the green juicing? You're, you're drinking the water from inside the plant cells. These are freshly grown plant cells and they're full of easy water. We measured and it's obvious that it's going to be there. So you're basically replenishing what might be missing from your cells um, with, with the inside of plant cells. Um, so I think that's why it works. Another one, there are various substances um, that come from Ayurvedic times and you know, Chinese medicine and such from way, way back that have been determined to be effective for health for many, many um, um, millennia, in, in fact. And we tested uh, by now, I think, eight, eight, eight of them. This is a sampling of some of the ones that we, we tested. And we tested each one in experimental chambers and we found that in usual concentrations representative of what you would have inside of you, they all build or expand easy water. So it's possible that the reason why these are so effective for many syndromes, many issues that you have, is, is possible that there's one simple unique mechanism. They build easy water and by restoring easy water to cells that are missing easy water or short of easy water, they can restore health. What are the other five? Sorry. Oh, what? Huh? What are the other five you tried? Uh, well, we tried um, coconut oil. Uh, we tried basil. Um, we actually tried um, salicylic acid or aspirin uh, and also a synthetic aspirin, same result. Uh, we tried CBD also. The study hasn't finished because um, word came down to the university that we're experimenting with marijuana and we had to shut down instantly right in the middle of the study, but we got positive results. Uh, <laughs> we have enough evidence. <laughs> okay, and well, sunshine, you know, we get radiant energy from the sun in Seattle where it's gloomy in the winter. You walk outside and if the sun happens to be shining, you feel good. And, you know, we think, oh, well, it's just purely in our, in our head. Such, but it might be in our head, but it might be that the light that penetrates our skull into our brain and the rest of our body is building easy water. And that's what makes us feel better. And, of course, the extreme of that is a sauna. Um, um, uh, so sauna is full of heat, right? 
and associated with heat is infrared energy. So you're being exposed when you go into the sauna to infrared energy, um, a lot of it. And when you come out 30 minutes later, 20 minutes later, you feel like a million bucks. Um, again, nobody really understands the reason. There are lots of speculations, but I would speculate that this energy that's coming into your body is exactly what builds easy water. And it's going to build wherever it's, it's missing in some way, so you feel better. The muscles that were aching don't ache anymore. Your headache is, is gone, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, earthing. So for me, it was a great surprise to find out that the earth was not neutral, that it has net negative charge. I think some of you or many of you already know that. And, um, and so if you connect yourself to the earth, the way our ancestors did on a regular basis. We don't because, you know, the soles on our shoes are made of non-conductive material and we have carpets and such, so we're isolated from ground. So if you connect yourself to ground in some way, like walking on the beach barefoot or bathing in a mud bath, uh, you're connecting yourself to the negative earth. Now, negative charge builds EZ. Remember, EZ is not neutral, it has negative charge. And we found experimentally that if you add negative charge, it builds the EZ. So I think the reason why earthing has been demonstrated, or grounding we call it, the Europeans say earthing, why it's so effective is that you draw out the negative charge from the earth when you connect yourself to it, and that builds EZ water. So, these are obviously speculative, but uh, I think they fit the paradigm, which means that basically if we return to um, closer to nature, closer to what our ancestors had done long ago, that we're going to be healthy. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting, um, I'm not suggesting that, that we photosynthesize, but I, I really think there's a close connection between what we found and the first step of photosynthesis. Um, so first step, remember, light that comes in, splits the water into negative and positive. A question that people don't ask really is, how is it possible that you can split water into negative and positive? Won't they just come right back together because they attract each other? That question is never answered. But what we found is something, something similar to that and, and maybe even more fundamental. It might be that the first step of photosynthesis is just merely one example of what we found, a very effective example of of course. Now I'm ending with practical applications because it seems that practical applications are um, important these days. Um, and what, there are two, briefly. One is getting energy from sunlight and, and water. So you've seen this now enough times. This is a hydrophilic surface next to water. Easy water is negative, bulk water is positive. If you put two electrodes in, you ought to be able to light a light bulb, right? And we demonstrated that, so here are multiple chambers with electrodes and pieces of uh, naphion. This is a switch, and here is a, a magnifier with an LED behind it. And so um, you turn on the switch, it lights the light. This is light obtained from water and sunlight, that's all, water and light. No, nothing artificial, nothing removed from the earth, no semiconductors or anything. It's very straightforward. And obviously we're trying to build this up now. We have a company that is working on this and also working on filtration. So getting drinking water from contaminated water. And again, the system is very simple. Um, it, the, the central feature is a tube of naphion. And remember when you have a tube of naphion, you have an EZ here and you have an EZ here and all the particles or junk or whatever goes to the center. So you can imagine input flow containing water and what have you, uh, bacteria, uh, uh, pharma pharmaceuticals. So what happens is all of them, um, uh, we, we use microspheres just as representative junk, it all gets, gets compressed in the center. And then we have what we call a differential extractor. It's nothing more than two concentric tubes. And so the concentrated stuff at the center goes out here. And at the periphery, it's basically EZ water, which contains none of that stuff. And you can see this is an actual result. And we've been able to get a separation of 200 to 1 in a single pass. And we're trying to scale it up for practicality. 
So we're also looking at salt separation because this is really the, the more or the most exciting that if you have ocean water coming in and you want to get drinking water out of it, you separate the salt, you remove the salt, and the water that you get from here is actually easy water, which is good for health also, and it should contain no salt in theory. And uh, we don't know if this is going to work, but we think it might, and we're, we're trying to develop this right now to bring it to practicality. So I end with uh, some conclusions, and uh, one conclusion is I need hydration. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, sweet water. Uh, okay, so I, I guess the, the principal fundamental <laughs> conclusion is that we think of water as having three phases, ice, water, and vapor, and I've demonstrated to you that there is a fourth phase, the easy phase, and I put it, I put it in between the ice and the water for a particular reason. It turns out uh, first of all, the structure of EZ is not so different from the structure of ice. It's not the same, but it bears resemblance. There's that hexagonal motif. And our experiments have shown that if you want to freeze water, you cannot go from water to ice. You must go from water to EZ and then to ice. And if you want to melt the ice, you go from ice to EZ and then to water. And we have published studies uh, demonstrating this. So this is, I guess, this is sort of the major point, but, and this has broad implications. And I think the central implication is that this, this water is absorbing energy from the, light energy from the environment um, all the time. And I've shown you um, a biological example, uh, including blood flow, also in chemistry. So when we, uh, we look at experiments done in aqueous solution and we try to analyze them. We never think of the role of light, the role of easy water, separation of charge, or any of that stuff. The, the textbook contains nothing of it. So if we're right in what I've demonstrated to you, then many interpretations in the chemistry book will need revision. In terms of weather, um, well, you know, uh, you don't, you listen to the weather forecast or watch it and you don't know whether you should bring an umbrella tomorrow or not. 50% uh, chance of rain. Well, how come only 50%? Why can't, they, why can't they do better? We've come to accept that often they can't do better. And I think one reason is, one reason is that um, they tell us that the, the atmospheric science people use temperature and pressure and also weather history to determine the next day's weather. They will never mention charge. I have never seen the word charge mentioned. Yet, the clouds are full of charge. The clouds are negatively charged, and you can see evidence of it sometimes when it's extreme. Charge has got to be really important. And if you understand cloud formation and easy water and the charges and such, you may in the future expect a better interpretation of what weather is all about. Health. Well, I've given you some examples toward the end of the talk about how water is critical for health. Um, and the food that you eat, if you want to dry it or freeze it or whatever, it's helpful to know something about the principles. Practical applications involve filtration, um, maybe desalination, what you're trying to, and getting electricity from light and water. So, uh, the next slide is my next to the final slide. It has nothing to do with what I presented to you, but I feel compelled. Um, it's called the Institute for Venture Science. And what the Institute is doing, and I'm closely connected with this Institute, is not related to the water, it's related to all of science. And we're funding promising ideas that challenge conventional thinking and may bring scientific revolutions. Uh, we, we got more than 200 pre-proposals, narrowed it down, got um, a dozen full proposals, and we nominated five of them for funding. And we're now looking for people of means who would like to give something back to society, um, looking for, for donors. I end with the last slide, which is the book that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, it's got pretty pictures, <laughs> and uh, it's turned out to, to be popular. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I think you were the, the first one with your hand up. Well, um, uh, you're surprised, but uh, I have 30, one, I have 90 minutes to do this. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and there's so much more that's in the book and, and stuff we've done since then. In fact, we're studying magnets. I'll just tell you one result. We don't understand it. Maybe somebody else does. You take a, a container of water, and let's say it has pH 7. You put a magnet next to it. If it's the North Pole, you put it next to it the pH will rise by almost one unit over 18 hours. And, if you, and it stays that way for some time. If you put the uh, south pole next to it, it does the inverse. The pH goes down by one unit. It's entirely repeatable. It's done in two different laboratories. Figure out what's going on. Uh, we have not tried it in the southern hemisphere, but um, it would be interesting to try. <laughs> yeah. um, I think one went up first back there. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, as the application is being used, it's sort of a two question thing. So, so watch the flow. Any applications available that have for studies to watch the flow of people that meditate, um, that, that flow, does it increase, decrease? Um, also, um, which flow are you talking about? The, you know, the capillary flow, you know, through light. You know, that flow that you get, you, you so it's infrared, yeah. brings it up. Have, have you done any studies? We, we, we haven't, but uh, at the Maharishi Maharish University, I, I think there are some people who are studying physiology uh, during meditation, um, and they're probably doing it, but I'm not aware of specific results. Then there was a question right back there. Yeah, the green, yeah. Great presentation, thank you so much. You. Uh, so two questions. Uh, first question is, um, what nanometer range red light does um, water mostly absorb? Is it near infrared or far infrared or, or all, the whole spectrum? Well, the, the um, water absorbs pretty much throughout uh, infrared, but some wavelengths are absorbed more than others. So water tends to absorb maximally at 3.0, 3.05 micrometers. And that's exactly the wavelength that builds EZ the most. See, so there seems to be a correlation between the amount of light that's absorbed and the buildup of EZ. Uh, so, or another way of putting that is probably most of the light that's absorbed gets con somehow the water is used to convert bulk water to EZ water. But it's, it's throughout the spectrum. There are some peaks. One is at 3 microns. Another is around 1 micron. And also at the longer wavelengths, too. So it's pretty broad. OK. And the, se the second question is, does deuterium affect creating easy water at all in, in, in any capacity? We studied deuterium. And uh, <coughs> it build, D2O builds easy water, but not as much as H2O. And uh, I don't know how to interpret that. I know that deuterium depleted water has been demonstrated to be to have health benefits, but I'm not sure of the relation between the two. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay. I, well, I need someone to choose for me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Suggestions or discoveries being made recently that water structure may be changing and, sh and it's, that may be impacting the ability of water to get into cells and semicolon the uh, uh, recommendation of vortexing in the biodynamics. Yeah, better do one at a time, otherwise I'll forget. Um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, nobody really understands about water getting into the cells. A Nobel Prize was given for aquaporin channels. And um, th there's, there's been some, some questions uh, coming partly from me about the real existence of ion selective channels to begin with. I think there's no such thing. Uh, there may be proteins sitting there, but they're not selective. And, and the idea that water goes through a particular channel, uh, I think the evidence is weak for that. So it's really not clear 
what, how water gets into the cell. And um, I tend to think that it has something to do with charges and attractions, simple attractions and repulsions. But n nobody understands that very well. I'm sorry, that's not a satisfactory answer. So I can't, I can't say. But, but I know that you know, some waters hydrate better than others. Uh, I would speculate that easy water is better for cellular hydration because it's got charges all around it. And charges, if you have charges, you have attractions. And it's possible that, that um, easy water could be attracted to penetrate into the cell easily. Uh, water does penetrate rather easily. Um, uh, uh, but I, I can't go beyond that, I'm sorry, uh, at the moment. You may be forming an easy zone in the process of entering wherever it's going. Yeah, sure, you may. Or, or actually, another possibility is that the charges, the negative charges from easy water get easily translated and convert ordinary water that's in the cell into the easy water that the cell needs. That's another possibility. Yeah. I was just wondering, the, do you think easy water may be the answer to the studies in plant and, and intelligence and plant memory? Absolutely. Because you were just talking about how it's like a thumb drive. Absolutely. That's where all the information in plants is stored. Then. Absolutely. And I know there's a lot of energy in plant, a, a lot of evidence in plants, as there is in animals and cells for this kind of communication. The subtle energy, people would call it. Maybe. How do minerals get across the easy to get into the plant cells? How do minerals get across the exclusion zone? Well, see, I, I, I think uh, the answer to that question is I, I conveyed something. I, I really didn't mean that the entire cell is pure, easy water. There are, if, if, if you have only easy water, nothing will, will go through it. You see, it's, it's static. But, you know, plant cells and other cells are dynamic. And so there, there, there are two things. Uh, one is that there are channels, uh, flow channels in plant cells and animal cells where it's not easy water. It's something like those tubes that I, uh, uh, flow in the tubes that I showed you. And, and so those tubes, the flow in the tubes, can be used either to send materials out or to, to draw materials in. That's the first. And the second is uh, uh, that there's a transition that occurs between easy water um, and ordinary water. Some of you know about action potentials in cells. A uh, cell undergoes an action potential. It goes from minus, say, 100 millivolts to something close to zero. And we demonstrated that involves a, a phase transition in the water from easy water to ordinary water. And an ordinary, a transient phase transition. And ordinary water, things can flow through very easily. So minerals can flow in or out. So in general, that's how I would respond to that question. I think there's some in the back that we were. Have you ever studied the difference of hydrogen bond uh, angle uh, of this water? Uh, I, I was reading something about this John Ellis. Have you ever looked at, at that? N no, I mean, you know, if you look at the bond angle, uh, nobody can see a bond, um, right? And so all of this is inferred. And usually inferences are, are, are built on assumptions. And I'm reluctant to, to uh, accept um, necessarily all of those assumptions. People make a big deal of bond angles, hydrogen bond angles, but I'm not sure that the evidence is convincing about that. So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned sauna. Uh, I was wondering, is there any difference if it's a cob sauna, a regular sauna, or an infrared, or a steam room? Uh, yeah, I think there should be, but I, I can't expound on it because, you know, if you have steam, uh, um, if you have steam, um, you can see the steam, right? Sorry, this is, is multi-step. If you can see the steam, that means the water that's involved must be bigger than the wavelength of light, otherwise you wouldn't see it. And, and we found in our studies that, that the vapor, if you can see vapor, like from, you go to Starbucks and you know, you have hot coffee, and if it's really hot, you can see the vapor that's coming up. So if you can see the vapor, it must be that the water that's evaporating uh, contains droplets that are bigger than the wavelength of light. 
And typically, if you measure the droplets coming up in evaporation, they're 20 or 30 micrometers. And each droplet, we found, is surrounded by an EZ. It's got a shell, an envelope of EZ. So that means if you extrapolate from there, if you think about a uh, wet sauna rather, uh, rather than a dry one, you have a lot of this EZ that is being, being created. And if you breathe in this EZ, or swallow it or something, or it reaches you, you're basically taking in EZ water. So a speculation, it's pure speculation, is, is that, uh, that the wet sauna is probably better for you, uh, but I'm not sure of that. <laughs> Just as far as the differences with the different types of dry sauna, like cob or regular or an infrared? We, we haven't studied that, so I, I, can't, I can't really tell you. I'm sorry. Uh, we, we have one in front here. Oh, well. Uh, one more short one. Uh, there's maybe one. I want to ask us, how can we use this information to improve the health of our soil and grow better plants? I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> uh, uh, to be honest, it's a, it's a question that I haven't thought enough about. And um, you put me on the spot. Uh, no, it's perfectly OK. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's a question that I should have thought about. Uh, um, well, I, I guess the first thought that comes to mind is that if you've got easy water um, in, in the soil, it should be good for the health of the plants. Um, you know, I, I, I can't cite any evidence for that, uh, but I can suggest that, that that might be the case. And so, um, um, uh, infrared energy, um, you know, I don't know how uh, if the soil is, is more absorbent of infrared energy coming from the environment, I, I suppose that could be better for the plants. Uh, I, I have to take a rain check on that, and I apologize, but I haven't thought about it. Do you have any evidence that like toxic plants or toxicity in the soil, like glyphosate, you know, like the effects of glyphosate can have any um, yes. Yeah, so we studied, we studied glyphosate uh, as a kind of control to see what it does to easy water. And we found that it diminished easy water. Uh, I told you about all of these, um, uh, the, these agents that build easy water, but glyphosate was a control. And, in any dose down to the really, really minute uh, concentrations, it diminishes easy water. I think this is, it's possible that this could be the reason why it's a weed killer. I mean, if, you, if the plant loses its easy water, it won't function, it'll die. So yes, that, that's a good question. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't answer this gentleman's question. Uh, of how to grow healthier plants. But um, I just want to emphasize, I think your ideas and bringing the idea of a charge into the study of nature is really crucial and neglected. And, um, and in, I've read some other things that you've written, um, understanding how weather operates using charge as a mediator yeah. between uh, Earth and the sun, the daily cycle, there's an awful lot to it. And uh, in terms of plants, vegetation is our is like the mediator between uh, the soil and and the energy of the that comes from the, the sky. And um, so, the condition of our climate, I think, is explained by the fact that we have massive dehydration and devegetation all over the earth. Yeah. So we have erratic weather because because we don't have stable um, conditions. Oh, that's a really important point. Uh, just something I was thinking about yesterday and hearing the presentation is that, you know, uh, in, in terms of global warming, so there's a big difference between, um, between ordinary water and easy water. Um, ordinary water it gives off a lot of infrared radiation, which we would determine, uh, uh, interpret as heat. Easy water doesn't. 
uh, because the charges are not moving around very much. So if you have a, a, a region filled with easy water, it should be cooler than a region that's filled with ordinary water. And a, a possibility is that the possibility is that the depletion of easy water from our environment due to poisons and such is contributing to the warming uh, because if, 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 if these poisons diminish easy water and produce ordinary water from easy water, temperature will go up. So just a thought that arose yesterday. So we have 15 minutes left.